bear crowns before the Lamb of God and sing, you are worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. And from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. And from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Day and night, died and day, let incense rise. Day and night, died and day, let incense rise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, Night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. <coughs> let incense arise. You are worthy of it. You are worthy of it all. And from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we worship you this evening, and we praise you, we glorify you, we thank you for your incredible faithfulness and mercy. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your holy name. You guys glad to be at church tonight? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Those of you sitting on the couch at home, you're missing out. You've got the couch anointing. <laughs> We've got the church anointing. Hallelujah. With one God, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King, what a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus, you didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of 
Jesus Christ my King What a wonderful name it is Nothing compares to this What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus We bless your name, O oh God. Hallelujah. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. And you are raised to life again you have no rival you have no equal now and forever God you reign and yours is the kingdom yours is the glory yours is the name above all names what a wild powerful name it is what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a powerful name it is nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the bones of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory, you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. amen. How many can say amen, amen to, that? to that? Glory to God. Glory to God. One more time. How many people can say, that, say amen to that? There you go. Praise God. Praise God. Here's a quick, quick scripture. Matthew. Matthew. I'm sorry. Luke. Chapter 12. Verses 33. 34. Once again, God bless you all. Amen. Uh, I'm going to read it from the uh, King James, and I'm going to read it from the NLV. Amen. And uh, 33, 34. Praise the Lord. Praise God. 33, 34. And it says, So that you have and give alms, provide yourself bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth 
corruptive. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Looking in at the NLV, it says, there is one, oh no, I'm sorry, here it goes. Sell what you have and give the money to poor people. Have money bags for yourself that will never wear out. These money bags are riches in heaven that will always be there. No robber can take them and no bugs can eat them there. Your heart will be wherever your riches are. Amen. So when you're giving an offering, when you're giving your tithes, it's given unto the Lord. But how many know that you also can give an offering to someone in need? And there are a lot of people in need. And if you don't know, if there's, if you don't know anybody that's, that, that there is need and you don't know, ask God. Pray to God and ask him, reveal to you, Lord, who is it that is in need? Reveal it to me. The Lord will reveal it to you. But it's, it's better to give than to receive, as the word says. So when you give an offering to someone in need, praise the Lord. Because what you're doing is, is what, you, what, you're giving to so, what you're giving to someone, you're really giving unto the Lord. And the Lord will pay you back 100-fold. Amen? So let us pray for the offering at this moment. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord God, your word is true. Father God, we thank you for the finances. We thank you for the finances in this house. We thank you for the finances for those that are online. We thank you for the finances for all the all that are here this evening. Father God, is there someone, Lord God, that's in need, my Lord? Father God, I know that you will provide for them. Whatever it may be, Lord God. Now that we are in a, if, an inflationary cycle my lord on high father god you know the money can have to be stretched lord god but let us continue giving lord god for you're the owner of all the gold and silver in the world my lord god i ask you lord god bless those lord that need to be blessed and i ask you god bless the offering for the night in the name of jesus i pray amen I know who I am, I know who I am, I know who I am, I am yours, I am yours, I know who I am, I know who I am, I know who I am. I am yours, I am yours, and you are mine. You are mine. I was running, and you found me. I was blind. And you gave me sight You put a song of praise in me Oh, I was broken And you healed me I was dying And you gave me life Lord, you are my identity I know, I know I know who I am, I know who I am, I know who I am, I am yours, I am yours, I know who I am, I know who I am, I know who I am, I am yours. I am yours, and you are mine. Jesus, you are mine. You are mine. Jesus, you are mine. I am forgiven. I am your friend. 
I am accepted. I know who I am. I am secure. I'm confident that I am loved. I know who I am. I am alive. I've been set free. I know who I am, I know who I am, I know who I am, I am yours, I am yours, I know who I am, I know who I am, I know who I am, I am yours. And you are mine, Jesus. You are mine. You are mine, Jesus. You are mine. You are mine, Jesus. You are mine. You are mine, Jesus. You are. Mine. It is good to be back in the house of the Lord. I am grateful to the King of Glory for my life today, for granting me breath in my lungs, a functioning mind. I got out of bed this morning. Everything else was icing on the cake. Ah! Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, well, thank you.
thank God he brought us through another week. And uh, we thank God for the worship. We thank God for our dear brother, um, Deacon Baez. He came and uh, gave us the scriptures. And uh, now it's time for the word. Tonight we're going to do a little bit differently, though. Tonight we're going to do uh, kind of a lecture style. And I'll explain why. You'll find out shortly. Let's take a moment and pray. Master, we thank you for the precious privilege to come to a place to worship you. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity that we have that is afforded to us, that is not necessarily afforded to so many that we can worship in public. We don't have to hide in caves. We don't have to honor you in secret. Father God, we, we can worship you openly and so many others in the world cannot. It's a privilege. We don't want to take it for granted. Father God, it is now time that we, that we open your word, we read it, we discuss it. I pray that your blessing would be upon this service. I pray that it would be upon the hearers online well as those that are here tonight. We pray that you would have your way, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If you would open your Bible to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews. Last week we were in Hebrews. We read from chapter 1. And uh, I just kind of want to go back to that, those three, uh, I believe those three verses that we read. I want to read them one more time to kind of refresh our memory. Hallelujah. Last week, we discussed how God has revealed himself to us. He has spoken to us through his word. We talked about what that actually looked like in the Old Testament as opposed to what we see in the New Testament how dramatically different it was and uh, the point I was trying to drive home is that God has not changed God is still that holy and righteous God that we read about in the Old Testament who will not be trifled with who will not be disobeyed he is still that same God and we see that same God manifested in Jesus Christ our Lord and that same God chose to speak to us through Jesus. Let's read Hebrews chapter 1, starting at verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom we he also made the, made the world. And he is, Jesus is, the radiance of his glory, his glory, the eternal father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the exact representation of his nature, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. God's word is precious. It is absolutely precious. And so it, 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 scripture tells us, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews tells us that the word of God from the Old Testament was given to us and God spoke to us through it. And we read about <clears throat> all of those Old Testament patriarchs. Let's turn in, let's turn to Hebrews chapter eleven, real quick. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter eleven. And there's sort of like a hall of fame, a faith hall of fame here in Hebrews chapter eleven. And it describes these Old Testament people 
their accounts, their historical accounts of how they overcame great trials and dilemmas and tribulations, right? Starting in verse 8, um, by faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place. By the way, I'm reading New American Standard Bible. By going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he left. Knowing, not knowing where he was going by faith, he lived as a stranger in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, follow, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder was God. By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive. Now, she was 99 years old, 90 years old when she had Isaac, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. God was God told them that she was going to conceive and she conceived many of us know that God follows through on his promises therefore even from one man and one who was as good as dead at that he was a hundred years old when when Isaac was born there were born descendants who were just as the stars of heaven in number and as the innumerable grains of sand along the seashore all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen and welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. So it was promised, God had promised to Abraham that his seed would have a place of their own, a land of their own, a country of their own. And generations and generations and generations had passed and they didn't get to see it. But God had a plan, and he fulfilled his promise. By faith, Abraham obtained it. Right? By faith, when Abraham, when he was uh, tested, offered up Isaac. And the one who had received the promise was, uh, who had received the promises was offering up his only son. Glory to God. God had tested Abraham. He told him to go up to a mountain, take his son up, and essentially execute him, offer him up as a sacrifice. And God um, did exactly what, I'm sorry, Abraham did exactly what God told him to do. He took him up to the mountain, and just as he was about to plunge the knife into his son's chest to follow the directive, or the directive of his heavenly Father, Almighty God, God stopped him and provided a sacrifice. Why? Because he wasn't supposed to give up his son. It was God showing us what he was going to do. What's interesting in that story is that it's a story that symbolizes uh, the father sacrificing his son. But what's interesting is that uh, Isaac was a type of Jesus laying on the altar, but Jesus was also the ram that God provided in the thicket. Isn't that amazing? God giving us this picture of what he was going to do. And on and on the list goes, by faith, Jacob. Um, and we read about these Old Testament patriarchs. And, and these stories are well documented in Scripture. The New Testament brought to us by the apostles, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul the Apostle. They all delivered to us the Word of God, the Scriptures. And they all have their place in history. And they all are famous around the world for what they've done. For both being in the scripture, but also delivering the scripture. For writing down and ca meticulously cataloging the words of God so that we could read it. The Bible itself, the book in your hand, is literally a miracle. In itself, it's a miracle. It's a miraculous book. It's a miraculous collection of books. You ever take a moment and wonder how it got there? How it got to your hand in a language that you can understand? Who made it that way? Jesus made it that way? I would say yes. But as he does, God used somebody very special to get it to us in the form that we have. Tonight I actually want to uh, give a little lecture about a man who is not cataloged in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. A 
a man who, quite frankly, does not get enough credit, believe it or not, for this book which is in your hand that you're reading in your own language. Because this book didn't come to us in this language, in, in, in the king's English, so to speak. It was written in, in Hebrew and Greek and a very little portion in Aramaic. Right? What we don't realize sometimes, this, this extraordinary book that, that we honestly we take for granted, that is in the palm of our hands, was delivered to us by the blood of martyrs. This book, this actual book, Tonight we're going to look at a, a gentleman who in history literally laid his life on the line to deliver this book to us in its form, in its English form. Tonight we're going to look at a little bit about the life of a gentleman named William Tyndale. William Tyndale. Right. This book is, in, in the English form, is actually only about 500 years old. Did you know that? It's only about 500 years old. The events we read in it are about 2,000 years old. But this version, where we can read it in our language, is about 500 years old. William Tyndale, in my opinion, should be in... A hall of fame for all to know. In fact, the the Bible that you own, this book, its origins in English started with William Tyndale. He was the very first one to translate it from the original Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew into English. There was another gentleman who had done it before him but he actually translated it from the Latin Vulgate. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. Therefore, the version that comes from the original texts is more accurate. It is, it is far superior than the one that is translated from the Latin Vulgate, which is inferior. Right? Can I get an amen, somebody? How many of us like watered-down Kool-Aid? You don't really get the full essence of the Kool-Aid. That, that flavor doesn't have its snap. Or if you leave your Coca-Cola sitting there with ice in it too long and all the ice melts, you take a sip and it's like, pfft. It doesn't taste right. It doesn't taste like, it tastes like watery Coca-Cola. That's kind of what that version of the Bible was from the Latin Vulgate. So one thing we have to understand, the, the, the context for which what we're going to discuss tonight is one of the things we have to understand is that the Roman Catholic cult <clears throat> we can't really call it a church I'm sorry I've learned way too much about it to understand to, to actually call it a church it's, it's a counter church it's an anti church it's a false church when you really start looking back at its history and all of the dirt that they had done um, to real Bible-believing Christians, you, you start to recognize that there's no way it's a, it's a real legitimate church. It's, it's just not right. Um, the Roman Catholic cult basically took the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Aramaic texts, and they translated it into Latin, into Latin. And um, so by, the round, by around 14, 1500, right, the 16th century, all uh, the, the Roman Catholic organization had basically hijacked Christianity. Um, and they made themselves the Catholic or the universal, quote-unquote, church. They, became, they, they announced themselves as the church universal and the Pope was their their leader. He's the Don, <clears throat> in a sense. He is the the Vicar of Christ, or Christ's stand-in. Right, one of his titles, which was carried over from the Roman Caesar, was Pontifex Maximus. 
the Pope today literally has that same title, Pontifex Maximus, which is the name for the Roman Pope. Um, I'm sorry, the Roman Caesar of old, right? Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar. Um, I can't remember the name of the freaky one at the moment, but him too. No, Augustus was all right. Octavius was all right. There was another one. Oh, Caligula. He was the freaky one that history likes to remember the most. <clears throat> um, and so what they had said and what they had designed was a false church where they had the Pope who basically is Christ on earth. And what they had decided was that the Pope himself was completely infallible. So that no matter what he did, what he said, what tradition he designed, what doctrine or dogma he designed, what church practice he designed, no matter what he decided would be church law, was, would become church law, no matter how crazy it was or where it came from. And so there was a movement <clears throat> in the late 15th and then 16th centuries called the Protestant Reformation. Oh, I caught him. There was a Protestant Reformation, and there were guys named like Martin Luther, who, uh, who Martin Luther King is named after, who was probably the most notable face, the most famous person from the Protestant Reformation. There came a time when Roman Catholic priests had decided what they're doing is not right. What they wanted to do was stick to the text stick to the standards of the Bible because there were too many things that the Roman uh, Pope was coming up with. One of the final things was something called indulgences. Right? Indulgences is something that the Roman Catholic organization came up with so that people could be forgiven of sin but through payment of finance. Before that, they had penance in different styles, right? One of them would be you would have to fast just on bread and water for weeks and weeks. And then and then another penance would be where you would have to literally injure yourself. You would have to flog yourself. You'd have to whip yourself. This was a form of penance. Really dark. Really evil. But this was not financially doable. They, they weren't making money on this kind of penance. So what the Roman Catholic organization started to do was they started to print these sheets of paper with things on it that were, I guess, um, uh, it talked about penance or something in some way. Maybe there was prayers on it. I don't exactly know what it was. I haven't seen the document. But they started selling these, these posters to people. And they would collect money from these posters. And these posters would represent to them they were forgiven of their sin and they were going to heaven. It's practices like that. I think that was one of the last things that had taken place in a very long line of really bizarre and inhumane practices on the part of the Roman Catholic cult. So now, one of the other major problem problems was the Bible was not in a language that people could understand. Now, what we're going to focus on today specifically is England, which is where we get our English Bible, to, uh, a copy of the Bible from. William Tyndale is an Englishman. Um, and uh, while he was growing up, people who went to church would go to church and the whole Roman Catholic mass, all church, all talking at the church, all preaching, would come in Latin. The priests would be speaking Latin for the entire church service from start to finish. Here's the problem. Nobody else spoke Latin other than the Roman Catholic priest. You couldn't understand a single word he was saying. 
even if he was reading from the Bible, you couldn't understand what he was reading. You couldn't understand what he was preaching. You would go, you would sit, you would listen respectfully, reverently, because you felt you wanted to have a connection with God. You wanted to know who God was. You wanted to have a relationship with God and, and have a sense of knowing that you're forgiven in some way, shape, or form. This guy's supposed to lead me to God, but I don't understand a single thing he's telling me. Could you imagine? That's the game the Roman Catholic cult was running. And it was very profitable. Now, if you can't understand a word I'm preaching, and I tell you, well, in order to go into heaven, you're going to have to pay such and such. You're going to do everything that you can to pay me whatever I tell you is going to cost to get to heaven. And make no mistake, the Roman Catholic organization lived a very, very, very lavish life. They still do till this day. They literally are their own sovereign nation in, in Rome, the Vatican. William Tyndale, he's born around 1492 to 1495 um, A.D. Now, they didn't have birth certificates back then, I guess. So, you know, it's, there's like a three-year span where he could have been born. They don't know exactly for sure. But for some people who were born in El Campo in Puerto Rico, it would be the same thing, right? <laughs> um, and, oh, one of the other things I forgot to mention, Parliament in England, um, at the beginning of the, of the 15th century, in the early, very early 1400s, had passed. They had the king, but they had also had Parliament at that time, which passed laws. Um, Parliament had deemed anybody translating the Bible into English um, would would actually be punished by it was literally called the um, I think it's called the law of the heretics the law of the heretics so heresy is you speaking out against church doctrine it's when you're when you speak out against proper and orthodox church doctrine heresy is when you try to turn Christianity into something else they literally made a law. Oh, it's called the burning of the heretics. That's what it's called. The burning of the heretics. Look it up. It's really interesting. They had come up with this law where if they caught you translating the Bible into English, if they caught you um, preaching from the preaching in English, if they caught you in any way, shape, or form, if you were writing the Bible at all, any other language but in England in English they could kill you they would literally burn you at the stake they would tie you to a post in some cases they would literally just set you on fire alive like uh, Joan of Arc I think is one person that they had done that to 1492 1495 uh, Tyndale is born as a young teenager uh, he goes to Oxford University in England, um, and uh, he's a very smart kid. I think he came from a farming family, um, but his family had enough to send him to Oxford. Oxford is a very prestigious university. Um, I know 12 seems a little young to go to Oxford, but that wasn't uncommon at that time. It was kind of like a finishing school that would prepare you for, for, um, for higher education. In 1512, he completes his BA at Oxford, um, at around 1515, he cl completes his MA or Masters of Associates at Oxford, and he's ordained as a as a priest, as a Catholic priest, right? And uh, but he refuses to enter the m monastic orders, right? So like people like um, um, like Martin Luther was was actually uh, they, what these guys would do. They would go away to a monastery. And they would take these weird oaths. Like one, one, one of these monastic oaths is you don't talk to anybody. You don't speak sometimes for years at a time. And all you do is spend your entire day working for free for no pay and serving the poor and not talking to anybody. You would take this vow of silence. 
and not and literally not talk for months, sometimes years. And this was supposedly, you know, surrendering and being subservient to Christ. Right? He refused to do this. I like this guy already. <laughs> 1519, he moves to Cambridge and starts working on his doctorate. He goes to Cambridge University, and while he's there, he attends a Bible study. He attends a Bible study, and he starts going to this Bible study in a, in a cafe in the neighborhood. And uh, there are a number of guys in this Bible study, and in this Bible study, he actually um, converted to Christianity. He gave his life to Christ. He repented of his sin, and, and he put his faith in Christ, and his world was turned upside down. While he's at Cambridge, he meets a gentleman named uh, Erasmus, who was a professor there. And Erasmus um, was a believer. He also had a copy of the Bible in its original form in the Hebrew and Greek. And so while he's there, um, not only is he now interested in, in the Bible in its original language, remember he, the, the Bible was converted into Latin at this time, but nobody read Latin. I, I, I think uh, William Tyndale did read Latin, but he wanted it in uh, uh, a form that his countrymen could read it. He's, oh, by the way, he was also highly fluent in eight languages. Highly fluent in eight languages. And he even taught himself Hebrew because there were no Hebrew scholars in England for him to learn from. Is that interesting? He literally taught himself. Why? Because he wanted to translate the Bible into English. And because he couldn't find anybody to teach him, teach him he taught himself. Amazing. This guy's amazing. Brilliant, brilliant man. While at Cambridge, he takes a copy of the original Hebrew and Greek text, an Aramaic text, and he, what he wants to do is he decides he wants to translate um, for a better version of the Bible from its original Hebrew and Greek. Right? Any Bible that you buy, by the way, you want it to come from the original Hebrew and Greek. You want it to come from the Hebrew and Greek. Um, and, and, and Aramaic. You don't want it to be a watered-down version. Every time you step away from the original Hebrew and Greek, the meanings sometimes change. You don't get the, the original um, ideas of the writers in their original state. And this is what he wanted to do. 1523, um, he, get, he takes a job as a tutor for a, a, a well-to-do family, um, believe it or not. And he's clearly overqualified for the job. He's teaching children at this time. Just a couple of kids, but living with a, a family. And, and fortunately for him, it's a Christian family. But the reason he takes the job is because it gives him the opportunity to study and start converting the text of the Bible. While he's living there, um, they would frequently have guests over. He meets a bishop that comes over to the house. And over dinner, he's having a conversation with this bishop. And during their conversation, the bishop tells him that the word of the Pope is so valuable um, that we really don't need the Bible. That the scriptures, the holy scriptures, you know, we could live without it. All we need is to follow the words of the Pope. It's adequate. It's sufficient. And, of course, William Tyndale uh, he literally says to this bishop something like, um, if the Lord gives me life, if the Lord gives me a long life, my mission in life is going to be so that the, the, the little boy plowing the field, the poor kid, the poor farmer out in the fields of my country will be able to know the Bible better than the Pope. And so while he's there, he makes that decision that that's going to be his mission. Um, so because of the law, you can't translate the Bible. You need permission. 
So he goes, he sees um, patronage from a Bishop Tunstall. And Bishop Tunstall, who was one of the leading bishops in the country at the time, told him, no, you can't do it. And so he, um, of course, you know, what do you think he does? What do you think Tyndale does? Oh, well. <laughs> oh, shucks. No, of course not. He does it anyway. He moves to Germany, right? Now, at this time, by this time, the Bible had already been translated into German by Martin Luther, right? Um, again, uh, I'll reiterate, this is the, this is the, the time of the, the Protestant Reformation. There are Roman Catholic priests around Germany, around all of Europe at this time, um, deciding that they're coming out of the Catholic um, organization, and now they want to stick solely and completely to the Scripture. The, the Protestant church is now starting, by the way, which we are. We are, we are a Protestant church, right? What does Protestant mean? You're protesting something, Protestant. And what the Protestant church is, it's an open protest against the Roman Catholic cult. Right? So all of the denominations, the non-denominational, the Pentecostal, the um, Baptists, all of them, Methodists, Mennonites, they're all Protestant churches. Presbyterian, you have basically a, a, a group of two, right, divided. You have the Roman Catholic cult, and you have the Protestant church with all of its denominations underneath in the world. But for some reason, they're all considered Christians. So if you talk to the average person on the street, they'll say Catholics are Christians. In name only, yeah. Yeah. And so he leaves. He goes to Germany where they're already sympathetic to the Roman, uh, to the, to the Reformation. Martin Luther has already been there for years. He's already printing copies of the Bible in German. In Germany, he wanted his people to be able to read the Holy Scriptures. Clearly, when William Tyndale is thinking, let me go there. Maybe I can figure out how he do it and do the same. Um, so he travels to Germany. He registers at the University of Wittenberg. Um, and uh, 1525, he then moves to Cologne in Germany. He prepares to print an English New Testament. Um, he begins printing, I think he was up to like the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 13. He starts in this printing press. By the way, it, it's also important to remember that whoever is making copies of the Bible in English, and if he's using a printing press, whoever the owner of that printing press and whoever's working there, they're going to die too. Anybody involved in converting the, the, the Bible into an English language, you're done. It's, it's a well-known thing. But this man is passionate. Obviously, God had, Christ had gripped his heart in such a way. He realized, he recognized, like we found in, in Hebrews just now, where it said God spoke to us through the prophets and now speaks to us through his son Jesus. He took that to heart. He understands that this is the word of God. This is the mind of God, and the people must know it. It must be accessible by everyone. So he was passionate about this thing. And even though the sentence of death would, would be imposed on his life, he was on the run for years. He was on the run for, I think, 10 years. He was 30 when he had to go in and, into hiding. You know, there's only two portraits painted of this guy. You know how we have, you know, all of the reformers, there are portraits of their likenesses painted, and they're accurate. They actually look like them. There are none of William Tyndale. There's two of them, and they were painted well after he was dead. So nobody really knows what he looked like. Why? Because he was on the run for so long, he didn't want anybody to know what he would look like so that he, he wouldn't be found. Right? He's printing the the the, the English test uh, the I'm sorry the new the English New Testament in this printing press in Cologne, and while he's there, 
a couple of the guys that work there, they go to a bar uh, in the town, and they, they toss back a few too many drinks, and they start getting drunk. And they start talking to the guys in the tavern about this book that they're printing. It's, it's the English New Testament. Goofballs. And of course, the guys in the tavern, they, they decide to go tell somebody. And uh, they decided to send somebody to the printing press. Fortunately, William Tyndale got wind of it before they showed up. And he took all of his materials and he got out of there right before they could capture him. Um, but he had to get out of town. He had to get out of town because they were going to kill him at this point. Um, he, he travels he, in 1526, a year later. He, he completes the printing in Worms, uh, Germany, I think it, it is, in Worms, Germany. And he smuggled copies of his New Testament. Um, and, they're certain, and they're now being circulated in England. And we're talking about little, little books, smaller than this one, that would fit in a pocket like in a woman's purse or a man's overcoat pocket, um, New Testaments. At one point, um, there is a, um, the same bishop that he went to for, for approval to translate, Bishop Tunstall. He finds out that the, the New Testament is being circulated in English. He finds out what William Tyndale is doing, and he, he tries to buy up all of the New Testaments, all of the books, and uh, fortunately for William Tyndale, people started realizing what this bishop was doing. And uh, the rich guys in the area were buying up all of the New, New Testaments so that they could get it out of their hands. What does that mean? The books sold up quickly, and William Tyndale had enough money to continue his work. He was able to print more Bibles and able to, pr to print better quality Bibles. Uh, 1530... By 1530, um, there are there are English agents looking to capture Tyndale. He's on the run. He's hiding. He's he's looking for sympathetic uh, book printers. Now, the other thing you have to remember is at this time, the printing press is brand new. Right, books that were before this time were handwritten, and they were they were. They were hard to read sometimes because people, you know, they're trying to make money, so they're working long hours, and you get tired. Your hand gets tired. Your hand gets fatigued. So the, so the words are hard to understand a lot of times in these books. Right now, the printing press, they have a printing press is all over Europe, and they're able to print these books. They would literally take little pieces of metal, have the letters printed out, line them up, and screw them together, and dip it in paint and then put it on the paper and it would come out identical every time. It was a high quality deal. So he's on the run by 1530. Um, his translation um, he starts, at, by 1530 he starts working on the Old Testament now and again, he's working on the Old Testament he literally has to teach himself Hebrew in order to translate. And he does a phenomenal job. He does a phenomenal job. 1531, this guy named Sir Thomas More begins writing against Tyndale. He starts writing against Tyndale, um, saying that this guy, uh, his, his version of the New Testament has something like 2,000 errors, that people should not be reading his heretical text. And, of course, they were lies. His stuff was flawless. His stuff was flawless. 1533... Um, a friend of his, John Frith, is now burned at the stake. By the way, that Bible study that William Tyndale went to, um, literally nine people out of that Bible study were all killed as martyrs during the Reformation. Nine of them. Nine of them. Because they were trying to get the word of the gospel out to the people of England in a language they could understand. Nine of them killed. In 1534, he moves into Thomas Ponitz's English Merchant's Boarding House in Antwerp. And this was the last place that he would live before he was captured. Um, there, was a, there was this boarding house where um, 
boat merchants would live in. Um, it was kind of a big house where I guess you would rent a room, and for some reason it was considered like it had like the same status as an embassy here in New York, right? So you have embassies in, in our country where if you walk into the building, it's like you're on a sovereign territory from overseas. You can't just do whatever you want. Well, that's kind of what this place was. So William Tyndale lived there, and he continued to work on the Hebrew portion of the, the Bible. And uh, he's basically untouchable as long as he stays in the building, as long as he stays there. They're continuing to print copies of it, and um, there's really no way to get to him. Even if they could find him, they couldn't go into the building and arrest him. So at this point, you have to also remember um, that um, the, the, the king's men in England are looking for him. The Roman Catholic Church is looking for him. Um, and they're both the dominating force in the world, like literally. And um, so while he's there, um, there's a guy that pops up in uh, London. His name is... Uh, Henry Phillips, who was in London uh, to do something for his father. He had, his father had given him a big pile of money to pay off his debts, but also to put in banks in London for him. And this, this young man, um, Phillips, Henry Phillips, he spent all of his father's money, and um, he was in trouble. We're talking about a, a substantial amount of money. Um, believe it or not, the Roman Catholic cult gets wind of the trouble that he's in and they actually pull him in and they tell him listen if you find William Tyndale for us we'll pay off all of your father's debts we'll literally take the money from the Roman Catholic coffers or the church the, the false church and we'll pay it all off you just go find this guy for us and bring him to us Henry Phillips says okay he's something he can't pass up. It's an opportunity to get back in his father's good graces. We're probably talking about a lot of money. So he goes, he's on the lookout for this guy. He finds William Tyndale in this merchant's house in Antwerp, and he strikes up a friendship with him. Obviously, it's fate. He becomes friends with him, and the other merchants inside the house warn him and they tell him listen we don't like this guy we don't know where he's from um, you ought to be careful with him you know but William Tyndale unfortunately you know he was he was uh, I guess he was too much of a nice guy and uh, he befriended him he gets invited to dinner by Henry Phillips and uh, he invites him to dinner outside of the house you know somewhere in town and they leave together and Henry Phillips has, has him set up he leads him through a narrow path. As he's walking through the narrow path, he's got um, Roman Catholic authorities standing on the opposite side of the path. And he tells you know, William Tyndale to go first. He's walking behind him. As he's walking through, he's pointing behind his head like this, pointing out who he is. And um, they grab him, William Tyndale. He's arrested. And they take him to... Uh, a place called Vilvoord. It's a really weird European name. It's basically a, a, a castle. And he's arrested there for, I think it was 15 months. Um, and uh, he's in prison. He, he's stripped of his clothes, literally. Um, they're able to take your clothes away when you're in prison there. And uh, it's cold. It's dark. While he was there, there were letters that he sent out asking for a few things. He asked for a candle so he could see at night. He asked for his own clothes so that he could be warm. And he asked for his uh, Hebrew dictionary and uh, the Hebrew scriptures so that he could continue converting the, the Old Testament into English. This guy's relentless. He will not stop. Will not stop. Passionate about getting the word of God out of the hands of people who are evil into the hands of people who God wants to read and know Him. Right? Last week we talked about how God wants to be known. 
He wants to be known. He wants us to know who he, who he is. He wants us to understand his nature. And I believe William Tyndale knew, knew this. In the end, William Tyndale, they do this, this weird mock, mock ceremony, the Roman Catholic cult. They, um, they put a robe on him, right? And it's like a ceremonial thing where they rip the robe off of him to show that he is no longer a priest. They take um, broken glass, sharp broken glass, and they literally scrape his hands to produce blood, um, which represents his own blood is on his own hands, and that the Holy Spirit has departed from him. Um, and what they did was they, they literally hung him with a metal chain um, and uh, they set his body on fire and inside of the fire so they put wood around him you know, so that he would burn up um, towards the end of the, the, the wood burning they threw in some gunpowder and exploded his body as well so he was hanged he was burned and they blew up his body so that there would be nothing left to bury he was hanged he was burned and they blew his body up so that he could not have the sacred rite of burial. We're talking about brutal. His last words, his last words, the very last thing he said, he said, Lord, open the eyes of the king of That's exactly right. Henry VIII. His last words were, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. What was he talking about? He was asking God to give the king of England the ability to understand why the word of God was so important. Why, why the people needed the word of God. How many times do you read in, in Old Testament and New he who has an ear to see, who he, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. He who has eyes to see, let him see. Old Testament, uh, God himself is talking to Moses about the people. They have eyes and do not see. They have ears and do not hear. Tyndale is asking God, he's begging God to open the king's eyes. Right? So, uh, like Jesus, believe it or not, the, the, it was a mock trial first with the Roman Catholic cult and then the Roman Catholic cult handed him over to the, the magisterial authorities and they're the ones that hung him and burned him and blew him up under the behest of the Roman Catholic cult so like Jesus he first had a, a mock trial with the, with, the, with the Pharisees and then he was handed over to Rome to be crucified His last words, Lord, open up the eyes of the king of England. 1537, there was a gentleman. This is now, that, that was in 1536. 1536. 1535, Tyndale is captured. He's held in prison for 15 months. He's killed in 1536. 1537, Tyndale's assistant, um, whose name was John Rogers, who was a former Catholic priest, he completes um, Tyndale's work. Now, there was actually another copy uh, of, of the scriptures made by another guy. I cannot remember his name at the time, at the moment. But it was totally bonkers. It was, it was terrible. John Rogers continues to finish the Hebrew text in the same scholarly way that when William Tyndale did it, he finished. Um, the King of England, 1537, realizes what a masterpiece the scriptures in English are. 1537, the year after Tyndale is killed, the King of England orders every church in England to have a copy of the Bible chained 
literally chained to the pulpit in every church. Why is it chained? So that it can't be taken away from the church. So that the preacher could, and it was, it was huge, it was called the Great Bible. It's a massive book. You literally opened it up and read from it. It was big enough that the preacher could preach from it on Sunday, but also it was chained and stayed there so that the people were allowed to come during the week and read it for themselves, but they could not afford a copy for themselves. A year later, do you think God heard Tyndale's cry? What an extraordinary man. What an extraordinary man. A few years later, um, King James, who was the, uh, the, the predecessor of um, George, who was it? The eighth? Henry the eighth. King James orders um, a new version to be put out under his authority, uh, which we now know as the King James Bible. He ordered to have um, dozens of professional translators to take the scriptures that William Tyndale had put together, had translated originally, and to make it better, to improve upon it, and to come up with a better version, which would be known as the King James Version. If I'm not mistaken, I, I think I remember hearing something like about 80 different people involved, scholars um, involved in translating this text. And believe it or not, he doesn't get any credit for it. Tyndale does not get any credit for it. But about 90% of Tyndale's work was kept intact exactly as it was because he had done such an excellent job Dozens of scholars spent time paid, right? Remember, William Tyndale was not paid. He, this was his full-time job, and he was on the run. He was just taking money from whoever he could to try to do this thing on his own. He wasn't getting help from anybody. There were no church organizations helping him. Not even reform groups were, were assisting him financially. He did this thing completely on his own, using his own giftings and talents to translate. One guy, when it was then reviewed years later by groups, droves of scholars, they could not make it any better than what he had already done. Isn't that amazing? This was a man of excellence, clearly driven by a passion that came from the Holy Spirit. And so, the Bible that you have in your hand today, today, 500 years later, is a direct descendant. No matter which version you have, if it's in English, this came from the mind of William Tyndale, the English version. It, obviously, it comes by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is the mind of God to us. But the translation into English came from William Tyndale. I hold in my hand a New American Standard Bible, originally from the mind of Tyndale, his translation. New King James, all of it. NIV, ESV, they're all descendants from it. Not all, not all of them are great descendants, but they're all descendants from it. His work, 500 years later, still, still, Carrying the gospel, saving um, people's lives, bringing people to eternal life with Christ. Isn't that amazing? The man, he died at about 40 years old. He died at a 40, was it 42? 42 years old. hard life. We didn't even know what bacteria was. <laughs> yeah, th 
This was act, act, the, the world is, was in a bad way at this time. During his day, the Black Death, the plague had already come. So now let me ask. This is precious. Not only did, when we read it, we realize that there are martyrs that were responsible for literally, they literally were martyred for delivering the word of God because the people rejected them. And then the actual copy of it, the version that we hold in our hand, the gentleman who was passionate about getting it into our hands, he was martyred because of people's agenda to control it for their own evil gain. How can we take this for granted? How could we not read it? My prayer for the church today is that we become as zealous for the Word of God grafted word of God, the actual word of God, God's mind toward us, that we would become as zealous and passionate about his word as William Tyndale was. It's pretty extraordinary. Amen? And for me, this guy's a hall of famer. James, this guy knocked it out of the park. For sure. Let us not take this word for granted. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Read that verse. Chapter 1, verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions, and in many ways in these last days of which we are living now has spoken to us in his son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the world and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Ladies and gentlemen, this is his word. This is his power. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the reformers, for all of their selfless work. Father God, let us not take their blood for granted. Let us not take their sacrifice to deliver the truth of God into our hands and into our churches. Let's not take that. Help us not to take that for granted. Help us to remember who we are and our heritage as Christians, born-again Christians, those who pursue Christ through his word. Heavenly Father, help us not to take the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross for us for granted. Father God, I pray that after we looked at the life of William Tyndale, I pray that we would be inspired by his example to love the Word of God, to sacrifice our own convenience that the Word of God may be broadcast, lifted up high, and understood by those around us. Help us, Lord God, to be living, living examples that we might inspire others the way William Tyndale has inspired us today. Father God, I find it very interesting that he did not receive the credit that he was due. The truth is, he wasn't looking for credit. He was looking to glorify you. He was looking to honor you. Heavenly Father, give us that same heart today. Give us that same heart 
that we might truly be your salt and your light in the earth. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Buenas noches, everybody.